April 1986, they never returned. We are in what was formerly a bedroom in this kindergarten, where children used to sleep and rest. Now there is a certain emptiness here. All these windows are broken, but the room continues to live on. Birds fly in here and sit on these bars. We even found evidence that an owl comes here. An owl, it regurgitates food, fur, bones and feathers. Evidently, it likes to sit here on this window pane, so this room continues to maintain life. Even trees, which had proven especially vulnerable to radioactive fallout, are finding new homes in the evacuation zone. I'm sitting in the Pripyat soccer stadium where 20 years ago, hundreds of people would come and cheer on their favorite team. And you can imagine the laughter, the sounds of the crowds here. The activity on the field, which 20 years later is barely discernible. soccer field now is going through succession as you would expect and returning to what it was originally hundreds of years ago which was a mixed deciduous forest. I grew up in a town about like this and I used to enjoy riding bumper cars like these about a half a world away. And it seems pretty sad when you look now and you see what's become of this beautiful city of Pripyat and that people will never live here again. But there's another side to this story, a very encouraging side, one that says that life is much more resilient than what we thought possible, that in the absence of man, that life will continue and that life will thrive and that the legacy of life will always be here because we are a part of life. Even if we disappear, our legacy of life will continue. It's 25 years into a life after people. Out in the country, nature is beginning to erase all evidence of man. In the suburbs, packs of feral dogs roam through decaying neighborhoods in search of their next meal. In some of the great cities of the world, solid ground is getting harder to find. In the time of humans, London was protected from tidal surges by 10 retractable steel gates that could be raised during storms to seal off the Thames River from the North Sea. Without humans to operate the barrier, London is defenseless. Another low-lying city, Amsterdam, meets the same watery fate. In a New York City high-rise, some windows have already cracked and slipped loose from their frames, and many more are on the verge of destruction. After a quarter century of exposure to moisture and heat without maintenance, the normally flexible window sealant has become rigid, locking this window to its frame. As the metal frame expands and contracts with changes in temperature, it induces stresses on the glass, which cracks and plummets to the sidewalk below. 
After a few of the windows fall out of a building like this, then the wind pressure effect changes dramatically. As well as external pressure coming onto the building, you also get suction, and that aggravates the problem, so more of the panels are likely to fall out. Through these gaping holes, the building fills with windswept debris. A summer storm rolls in. On top of the structure, the copper lightning deterrent system that once protected thousands of office workers is now corroded and useless. A lightning bolt turns the tower into a raging inferno. The gutted building makes the perfect home for a surprising survivor. Although pigeons once relied on the handouts of humans, they have done just fine in 25 years without us. Pigeons are survivors. They can live in the wild, they do live in the wild still. And in a period where there were no people, but there still were edifices and artifacts, our buildings, they would do very well because they would adopt these as kind of artificial cliff faces, which is what they really are adapted to. Like the pigeon, the disappearance of humans forced a change in the habits of the lowly cockroach. Think of the poor cockroach. After they gorge upon our surplus when we're gone, they'll mourn us. They'll be sorry. But the mourning won't last for long. While cockroaches thrived on our scraps, they can also eat book bindings and cardboard and any rotting organic matter including dead leaves and roots. While food isn't a problem, roaches also need warmth, the kind that humans had always supplied through artificial heat. Cockroaches started as a tropical species, and some experts say they couldn't survive the winter in colder cities. But it's hard to bet against a creature that has seen the dinosaurs come and go. Cockroaches are extremely adaptable. They've been around for 300 million years. If I had to bet, I'd put my money on them being able to survive in one form or another. The first winter after humans did witness the die-off of some cockroaches. But many more moved underground to find warmth until milder temperatures returned. In an abandoned downtown, devoid of insecticides, overrun by vegetation, and with a rising water table, this former pest is now enjoying a golden age. Cockroaches were only a nuisance to humans, but wolves were a terror. So man hunted them mercilessly. When the first European settlers arrived in what is now the United States, it's believed nearly half a million wolves roamed the countryside. By the 20th century, these predators were nearly extinct in the lower 48 states. Now, with no humans left to battle them, wolf populations multiply by as much as six times each year. Within 25 years of our disappearance, there could easily be half a million of them roaming the United States again. This amazing comeback has been seen on a small scale before. In 1995, biologists released a few dozen wolves within the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park, a place where they would be protected from persecution by humans. Within a decade, a few dozen had multiplied into 1,500. And the wolves